We honor the dead not just by remembering them, but by taking up the cause for which they lived and died. We must rise to fill their vacant places. Someday, we too will finish and join that cloud of heavenly witnesses. For now, let us run our part well, strong and persistent, upholding the cause until we successfully pass it on to the next wave of runners. This is our day. By faith we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. In the lives of those who prove his faithfulness, who walk by faith and not by sight. By faith our fathers roam the earth. When the power of his promise in their hearts of a holy city built by God's own hand, a place where peace and justice reign, we will stand as children of the promise. Amen. Today is Memorial Weekend, and tomorrow we will celebrate and remember those that gave the ultimate sacrifice their life so that this nation, this country, could keep its freedom. We are so blessed for that. I, I just want to mention we've had a wonderful week last week, and if you didn't get a chance, the newest uh, church paper is out. It's on the back, but it has a picture of the class of uh, 2019. It was our 44th graduation and uh, amazing uh, baccalaureate and graduation service. Those of you who got to attend, 
both nights were uh, fantastic and uh, just people went away saying wow this this was amazing we are so blessed for a wonderful wonderful student body uh, I, I wish some of you that don't come to our school are part of it to get to meet some of them but they are amazing and we are blessed to have them and I just want to say publicly thank you to the administration that worked so hard our staff our teachers they once again did a wonderful wonderful job but then on the back side Tuesday, a week from Tuesday, June the 4th, we will be closing on the remaining 10 acres. And there's just a little article about all the land purchases that the church has bought through the years. The first one was in 65. And if you add it all up, the first 35 acres that the church bought, it's around 2.6 million because uh, we got them really cheap. I mean, some for 17,000 for five acres. Uh, and as you know, the 10 acres that we'll be closing in on Tuesday, June the 4th, it's 3.6 million. In fact, those 10 acres are far more costly than the 35 acres that we had a house on, a barn on, a church building, and, and all the others. But you know what? God has his ways. I wish we could have foresaw, and the owner of that property would have sold us a long time ago when it was cheaper, but that wasn't the case. And But we just praise the Lord that uh, that property will be continued in and will be bounded by Miller, 120th, 118th, and the canal. Uh, so praise the Lord for his goodness. It is Memorial Day weekend. And as we think about tomorrow being Memorial Day, my question is, what does Memorial Day mean to us? Is it mattress sales, barbecues? Is it going to the beach? What does Memorial Day mean to each one of us? Is it extra time off from work, a three-day weekend, eating out? or perhaps remembering others. I think of the lady that had gone to the commuter train station and a policeman noticed her with her head bowed over her steering wheel and obvious discomfort. And he walked over to the car and the police officer asked, is there anything wrong, ma'am? And she's just kind of laugh, half crying, half laughing for 10 years. I've been driving my husband to this station every morning to catch this train. This morning, I forgot him. The worst thing that we can do is forgetfulness. And as we think about our nation, and tomorrow many people will be enjoying and relaxing, but it's a special day. It's not just a holiday that we can have relaxation. It's a day to remember so many that put their life on the line for us. And today as I speak and today as we sit here in this auditorium, there are men and women all around the world that are protecting the freedom of the United States of America. And we're so blessed. And many of you that are here today have served in our armed forces and our appreciation to each one of you. Thank you so much for giving of your time and your uh, life to this nation. We have such a wonderful, wonderful nation. Oh, we have our problems. But we have a nation that is honored and glorified because of men and women that have willing to protect the freedom of America. You know, the founding of a nation is a very remarkable thing. Throughout history, there's been many attempts to create civilizations. For instance, Pericles founded the civilization upon culture, the Athenian, and it fell. Alexander the Great founded the civilization upon military power. He was a genius, and it fell. Caesar founded a civilization upon power, and it fell. Yet there's something unique about the founding of America. America was founded by men and women who were seeking God. These men and women were sturdy who crossed the ocean to come to a land, not seeking soil, not seeking gold, but for liberty for their souls. When we study the history of the founding of this land, we discover that there's something unique about our beginnings. You see, folks, this is a nation that was founded upon the Word of God. And I don't care what politicians are say and say this is not a Christian nation. This nation was founded upon that. And yet we are seeing ourselves move away from that. We, we notice, pray for America. America needs our prayers. And tomorrow as we as a, a nation, a country, will celebrate a special day, Memorial Day. It was started back in 1868 by General John A. Logan, a Grand Army of the Republic. 
He set aside May 30th as a decoration day to commemorate the fallen soldiers by adorn, uh, adorning their graves with flags. And uh, it kept up till the beginning of the 20th century, when they, uh, and early 20th century, when after World War I, we saw the importance and the need of remembering all those that died in the line of service. And so May the 30th was that date that was celebrated, uh, the last days of the month. But in 1971, the Act of Congress established the observance to be the last Monday of the month, which will fall tomorrow, May the 27th. You know, in 2002, or 2000, Congress passed the National Monument, or Moment of Remembrance Act. And at three o'clock Monday, they asked everybody to take a minute of silence in remembrance of all those who died to keep this country free. What a wonderful way to observe those families that gave their husbands or their wives or their uncles or their dads to be able to serve this country. We have so much to be thankful for. We have so much to, to honor the Lord. And yes, as I said earlier, it's not about barbecues, and those are fine, and I hope you have good barbecues. And it's not about trying to go find a good mattress, and there'll be people on corners with the sale signs up saying, buy your mattress today, the best price in the world. No, Memorial Weekend is to remember those people that gave their lives for us. And that's what I hope and I pray that we will do. This morning, I chose in a passage of Scripture of the Invisible Army. The Invisible Army, as we see it today, and, and as we notice this particular uh, thought here, the Invisible Army, found in 2 Kings chapter 6, reminds us of some similarities of our nation, our country, our world. And this army, probably none of us have ever walked outside our door and saw an entire army ready to invade our home. Well, that's exactly what happened there in Dothan to, to Elisha. His servant was out, and he come running back, and he came so excited, and he woke up the prophet. He says, we got a problem. There's a situation out there you can't believe. We are in danger. We need a I don't know what we're going to do. And he was so excited. And Elisha acted so calm. He already knew it. You see, he'd already been getting direction and, and wisdom from God what was going to take place. That's why the king came to get Elisha, thinking he was going to capture him. Not Elisha, because he belonged to God. And God had his hand upon him. And so he tried to calm down his servant. And he kept his cool in a calm response there in verse 16 of chapter 6. He says to his servant, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. We have so much to pray. He prayed that his servant's eyes would be open. Suddenly the servant saw the unseen spiritual army that surrounded the others. That mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha, protecting the nation he strolled out to greet those soldiers calmly and asked God to strike them blindly and led them to a capital 12 miles south of where they were at. And then he asked God to open their eyes and he directed uh, the Israelites to feed them and to send them on their way for a while. The Armenians did not bother Israel again. You see, the story we have here this morning really has two main themes, and I want to look at those two main themes as we think of this day, and we think of how God has protected America all these years in our history, and how he has graciously given to this nation so much. The very first theme I want us to think about is that God, God is all sufficient to meet any crisis. Folks, we all go through crises. I don't know if anybody in our service this morning can say, I've never experienced a crisis. We all have. I can tell you numbers of them that I can remember uh, that, that happened, and I, I was wondering, what are we going to do? How are we going to handle this situation? I can remember the phone call that I got from my wife's brother-in-law's wife and saying that David had been in a motorcycle accident, and they're air rescuing him now to Jackson Hospital. That was a crisis that my wife and I just couldn't believe would ever happen. He had just found out he was going to be a father, and this crisis came. I had to make a phone call to 
his parents to my father-in-law and let them know that his son was no longer living. Those are little crises that come our way. What do we do when crises come? We have to understand when crises come, God is sufficient, folks. God is able. God is enabled to help us. You know, when 911 happened, I remember having the television on and just thinking, what is taking place? We've never really been attacked here on our land. What is going on? And then I just have to remember, God is sufficient. God's going to take care of us. We had strong leadership. Then the president did go back to Washington because, you remember, there was planes coming to hit his place. And he flew around in the air for many, many hours. No flights were able to leave. But God was directing this nation and leadership and giving us wisdom how to go about. Folks, God is all sufficient. During D-Day, June the 6th, we'll be celebrating in just a few days, more than 160,000 Allied soldiers landed on a 50-mile stretch of a heavily fortified French coastline. They were there to fight the Nazi Nazis on the beaches of Normandy. And our general, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, called the operation a crusade in which we will accept nothing less than full victory. More than 5,000 ships, 13,000 aircraft supported that D-Day inv invasion, and by the day's end, the Allies gained foothold into continental Europe. The coast in, uh, in there uh, on D-Day was high. More than 9,000 Allied soldiers were killed. Usually our president or one of our leadership go over there on that particular day and visit the graves of many men and women that gave their lives. Why? To get rid of uh, Nazism, to get rid of Hitler, to get rid of this control and this dictatorship. God was so good. The very next day that after the, our, our troops landed on the shores there of Normandy, our president then, Franklin uh, D. Roosevelt, he got on and said the great, and had a prayer. And I want to just share a little bit of his prayer because I want you to see the consistency of God depends upon Americans and men and women to keep God involved in our lives. Listen to just a little bit that he says, our Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight, lead them true, give them strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard, for the enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again, and we know that by thy grace and by thy righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. Folks, we serve a God that cares. We serve a God that is going to protect us. And as we think of his sufficiency to this nation, to this country, we think of his, his omniscience and how he's protected us all these years. I am proud to be an American. I'm proud to wear this flag. I'm proud that I can represent this nation and anywhere I go. And you know, I'm, I'm thankful when I go to a place where they do the national anthem and be able to stand. You know, I still get butterflies. I still get feelings. I am so blessed that God has allowed me to grow up in the greatest nation in the world. And I know it didn't come free. I know somebody paid a price so that I can enjoy this freedom so that you can enjoy the freedoms that we are. Our God is omniscient. He knows all things. He possesses all wisdom. And he knew this army was going to surround Elisha there in Dothan. And he forewarned him. And he kept his calmness. He didn't get too excited. He knew that God was going to protect. Folks, God is amazing. God takes care of us. The psalmist has beautifully said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in our troubles, in crises. Where do we turn? But to the Lord. It is the Lord that honors us. It is the Lord that takes care of us. You see, that text refers to one of the most wonderful instances of the providential care so often repeated in the history of the Israel nation and the history of the United States of America. I'm so thankful for the leadership we have right now representing us in Washington, D.C. Oh, they're not perfect, folks. I know that. They have their failures and their mistakes. But you know what I found and I've seen in the last few years of this leadership, the team that is leading our country? They want to put God first. They want to honor him. 
The National Day of Prayer was once again uh, spoken about in this last leadership team, which it hadn't been in a few years. We have a nation, we have a country that puts God together. You see, so often the scheme of the enemy had been defeated that the king of Syria was exasperated and puzzled. Imagine how in a world a traitor in his own camp had disclosed his secrets. And he wondered how it happened. And none of the servants could say it has. Although one says there's a man that is known as a prophet, Elisha. And somehow he's saying everything that you're doing before you even do it. And that puzzled the king. How in the world could that happen? I mean, only my people know that. I got to find this man. And that's exactly what he did. He sent this army out to capture the prophet of God. And God was so gracious, and God took care. You see, that Armenian king stupidly thought that he could send troops and take Elisha captive. God's all-sufficiency meets us where we are. God is going to take care of us. God is going to honor us. God knows everything. We're foolish to think that we can hide anything from him. He's omniscient. He knows all things. We need to pour our heart out to Him. We shouldn't hold anything away from God. God knows. Those hidden sins that we're hiding deep down, thinking nobody ever is going to find out, folks, God knows. We need to, give him, we need to let God's uh, Holy Spirit convict us and show us those areas that we're not walking properly with the Lord, that we can get right. Our God knows everything. We can go to Him for the wisdom that you and I lack. In our context, in our trials, God says, but if any of us lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives all men generously and without reproach. God is so good. There's a second thing I want you to see. Not only is omnipotence, is omnipotence, uh, his omnipotence. Uh, think about that this morning. He not only knows how to solve our problems, but he has unlimited power to deal with the biggest problems that we could ever conceive. The biggest problems problem that we could ever imagine or ever come up with God's able folks there's nothing that's too hard for God he does the impossible we're thankful for that we're thankful that he protects us I think of the passage there in Psalms 34 that reminds us the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues them and then there in Psalms 27 3 it says therefore thou through a, through a host encamped against me, my heart will not fear. It was no big deal for God to strike all those men with blindness in response to Elisha's simple prayer. There is no man, no nation so powerful, but that God can easily bring them to nothing. And that's what we see in our text. The king of Syria saw how God operated, saw how God worked, and God was able to take care. There are no foes harder to battle than those that we cannot see. There are no forces more difficult to contend against than those which cannot be brought within the limits of our sight. We cannot em estimate the numbers of such a foe. We can't detect the movements nor calculate how we can avert or counterattack them. Against such a presence, we are helpless and defenseless. Psalms 121 reminds us that uh, his presence of the invisible, we forget that he who keepeth Israel never slumbers or sleeps. Joshua reminds us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. God's not going to leave us alone. He is sufficient to meet us, his omnipotence, and then thirdly, his protection. God's protection is, is amazing as we think about it this morning. There in Psalms 91 and verse 11, he will give his angels charge concerning you, to guard you in all of your ways. The Lord is stronger. The most powerful enemy we can conceive of, he's protecting us, even when we aren't aware of it. I think missionaries on the mission field and come back and telling us stories you would not believe in, in this particular moment of what was taking place in our part of the world. And we heard that some of you were praying and God took care of us. Folks, we serve a God that protects and watches over us. What an amazing God that we serve. There's a second thing I want you to notice as we think of the two themes that are here. Prayer is our access to an all-sufficient God. Prayer is our access. Folks, 
We can't go it alone. And when these crises come, where do we turn? But to the Lord. To the Lord. You know, uh, as we think about our greatest enemy, yeah, humans, uh, armies can be our enemy. But you know what? Paul tells us there in Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Folks, the devil would love to trip us up. The devil would love to put us out of commission, put us on the sidelines. And he can easily do that by getting us to fall for his traps. But we need to stay close to the Lord. Prayer is our access to all sufficient God. God wants to hear our prayers. God wants us to pour out. I understand that God knows everything. And he knows even before you ask, but he wants us to ask. He wants us to throw our, our lives to him. He wants us to, to ask him to help us through this situation. There is no situation that you will go through, church, that God is not able to help us. A couple things here. Prayer always replaces panic. Prayer always replaces panic. Prayer is our means to access him. But as we think about the wisdom that we can get in dealing with trials, go to the throne of grace. And how does he tell us to go? Boldly. Don't go kind of sheepishly. We serve a God that wants to answer our prayers. And all he wants us to do is to approach him and to do it boldly. An obvious contrast between the panic of Elisha's servant and the peace that Elisha had. The servant was just beside himself. He couldn't understand what was going on. But Elisha peacefully was able to just approach the throne of grace and ask God to do what he could do. Our God can do the impossible. I believe that Elisha knew how God wanted him to deal with the crisis because he had prayed. And he was taught to pray from his mentor, Elijah, who had called down fire from heaven. And it consumed some soldiers who came to take him captive. God took care and God honored. Uh, what a wonderful picture. What a wonderful pace. I, I, I think of, you know, uh, as Christians, we ought to be peacemakers. We ought to be bringing the kingdom together, not hurting the kingdom, not causing problems. I'm thankful for this nation and for what we stand for. So prayer uh, is replaced by panic. And then secondly, prayer opens our spiritual eyes. Elisha already knew. Before it ever happened, he was aware of this situation because he had had a sweet communion with his God. And God was directing him. God was giving him leadership. God was giving him wisdom and was helping him to go along the way. And see, prayer opens our eyes. Folks, we can't do without prayer. And yet I hear of Christians that have been Christians for a long time. They don't pray often. In fact, if they pray a couple times a week, that is a lot. Folks, it ought to be a daily exercise for all of us as we begin our morning, as we go through our day, as we approach him, pouring our, our hearts out to God. He opens our spiritual eyes and he shows us what's ahead. I'm so thankful how he has done that in my life. And we could take hours and allow you to share testimony how he's done it for you. But we serve a God that's all sufficient and we have the access right with us. It's the tool we need and it's prayer. And number three, prayer makes possible what is humanly impossible. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God makes possible what is humanly impossible? I do. I've seen him do that. Folks, we are praising the Lord for the wonderful way that uh, we're going to be purchasing that land in two weeks. Folks, we had all of us believed that land was ours. In fact, you remember a number of us uh, on a Sunday walked out there and we had a prayer circle out there and I wish I had somebody that had that picture that we could put up. But we took a picture of that team and we prayed, Lord, we claim this land for you. And it was slipping away from us. I mean, it was almost a done deal, guys. The guy that was bought the property was in contract with the owner. He was a state legislator. He was known by all the commissioners there in downtown Miami. Folks, it didn't look good. And people were telling us, it's going to happen. You're just going to have to compromise. God did what was humanly impossible and brought it about so that today we could say with wonderful, po positive thing, to God be the glory, great things he had done. Folks, he does it day in and day out. I think of this ministry, and as you read that article, a, a little church that started in an elementary school, and what the worth of this ministry is today, it just amazes me. It's because of great leadership through the years and how we have 
uh, made sure we used our funds wisely. And God has answered. God has taken care of. And uh, folks, we serve a God that cares. And we serve a God that wants to provide for us. We serve a God that has as much for us as possible. And prayer makes it possible. How's your prayer life? So often we pray, we forget that we're asking God to do something that's humanly impossible. And when we pray for the salvation of somebody, another person, we're not asking God to help them out just a bit. We're asking God to do what is humanly impossible. I think of my sister's salvation. After I got saved as a 12-year-old boy, she was four or five years older. She went into the Marines. She served many years. She married a Marine. And uh, she moved on the other side of the coast, 3,000 miles away. I had very little opportunity to witness to her. And I would visit every now and then, and I would tell her, and she was so happy for me. Oh, I'm so proud of you, and I'm so happy what God is doing to you. That's not for me. She wouldn't go to church. I said, Marcia, this is what you need. And she said, yes, 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 but she never responded. Eighteen years I prayed for something that I thought was impossible, humanly speaking. I could be on the West Coast all the time. But God brought a Christian into her life, and she called me up one day. She says, Mark, you're not going to believe this. And she started sharing with me with the humanly impossible situation that I prayed and prayed and never gave up. My sister came to know Christ as her Savior. Folks, don't ever, ever give up thinking it's humanly impossible. God can do the impossible, and we're so grateful for that. He did that for Elisha. He did that for the nation of Israel. And that's just one story I shared there with the nation of Israel. Many, many stories I could have chose. But that one particular one, God humanly did something that no one ever thought could happen. He blinded the entire army of Syria. Those Armenians had no access and opportunity, and they were led alike like captives, just being taken to that city 12 miles away. Yes, this nation is blessed. This nation has so much to be thankful. Many years ago, there was a singer in America who was very popular. Her name was Kate Smith. Oh, we've heard her name come up just recently, and this is, you know, the uh, thing of the world that people are just trying to find things against people that are trying to live a, a good life. But this lady had a radio show. This is way before, way before TV had become popular, and she had become very popular, probably known as one of the greatest singers of that time. She repopularized a song that was done by Irvin Berlin after World War I, and it was a song, God Bless America. Folks, do you believe that God has blessed this nation? I do. The greatest nation, I believe, on the face of the earth, and I'm so proud that I could be a part of it. And I'm going to do everything I can to keep God in this nation. And I hope you are doing the same. I hope you are giving all that you possibly can to make this nation continuing to be great. Vote, vote, vote. If you, I've heard Christians tell me, oh, there's nobody on there, and they didn't go vote. Shame on you. God's given you the wonderful, wonderful privilege to live in this nation. And that's what happens to countries when people just kind of become stagnant and just complacent. Don't ever get that way. We had Wednesday night, one of our alumni, one of our graduates, the class of 1990. I was so proud as I sat up here on the platform and hear her share, this, this is where I got my beginnings. And she shared her face. She says, a young girl, I trust, she was raised in a Catholic family, but her dad and her mom set her and her two sisters to Westwood Christian School. And she heard the gospel and she came to know Christ as Savior. And she travels all over our state representing our state. Folks, I pray for her every day because you know what? The, the left doesn't like that. And the left would love to hit it down. Pray for our leaders that they will be strong and that they will stand strong in the difficult times that they go through. Yes, I believe with all my heart, God has blessed America. And because of this blessing, we have so much to be thankful for. I began with a little humorous story of a lady that said she forgot her husband after 10 years driving him there. But you know what? Sometimes we forget how this nation came about. And we forget the people that gave their life. Let's pray for their families. Let's pray for those that come from those families. I don't personally have somebody in my family line 
that gave their life, but I know of those. Pray for them.